what I would speak about. But then the Lord made it clear that I could find no better a text than the one that we studied in Sunday school three weeks ago. The scripture that day was Luke 10, 25 through 37. If you want to go there, we'll get there shortly. It's the familiar parable of the Good Samaritan, which along with the parable of the prodigal son, is probably one of the two most widely known and quoted of all of Jesus' parables. And these parables, these two parables in particular, are not just parables that Christians quote. Other people talk about the Good Samaritan or the prodigal son as well. Now why is this lesson, why this particular lesson of this parable is so important? Because everywhere we look today we see hate and we see discrimination at those who are different. As Christians, we can't let such feelings and attitudes find a comfortable home in our hearts. As Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, he said that our attitudes can be just as sinful as our actions. Even if the, on the surface we seem to be doing the right thing, that may not be the case. It's easy to love people who are close to us, our family, our friends, people who look like us. We'll go out of our way to express our love to those close to us. When our children or our grandchildren or our parents want something, we'll often do everything in our power to see that they have it. There's no limit to what we'll do to meet that particular need. Why do we do that? Because we love them. No inconvenience or expense is too great if they have a need. Much of the time we'll do the same for our best friends. These are our people, or as they might say today, our peeps. And we are compassionate towards these people. We take care of them. But what about other people around us? Everywhere we look, we see people in need. Do we have any obligation to them, to love them? And just where do we draw the line? Or is there a line that we should draw anywhere? It's not a new question. Jesus addressed this question head on, and he addressed it numerous times. But in this case, he told an interesting story that his hearers would understand maybe better than we do today. But they would understand it, and he made a point that kind of caught them off guard. And in doing so, he redefined what loving compassion looks like. He <coughs> calls us to a higher standard. So first, let's examine Jesus' teaching. Again, Luke 10, 25 through 37 to gain a better understanding of what he's clarifying for us. And then we'll seek to grasp how God would have us act on this important lesson. And before we open God's word, let's go to him in prayer. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all those who are here today. We ask for your blessing upon them. Help us, Lord, as we open your word to see the truth. It may be plain or it may not be plain, but Lord, you have truth in these words for us to hear and to do more than just hear, but to apply to our lives, to take into our hearts and make them part of our everyday walk. And we ask, Lord, that you would do that, clearly help us to see this message so that we can see what Jesus was implying, what he meant, and what you mean through these words. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Starting in Luke 10, 25, we're told, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, that is, Jesus spoke back to him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, 
he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Jesus now asks of the lawyer. And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do likewise. Now as Jesus traveled, he often stopped along the way to teach. A crowd would gather, and he would proceed to impart eternal wisdom that only he could do. As part of this particular teaching session, or at its conclusion, a certain lawyer stood up to ask a question. <clears throat> now in the teacher-learner situation, normally the students would be seated, and the teacher would be seated as well. So the fact that the lawyer stood up tells us that he didn't just walk up at the end of this particular teaching session that Jesus was conducting. He may have been there for the whole session. The man raising this question was identified as a lawyer meaning someone who was considered authoritative in the Jewish law. An expert in the law, one might say. Now, most often in Luke's Gospel, when a lawyer is talked about, he's not talked about in a good light. He's talked about as someone who was an opponent of Jesus, who was often trying to ask questions to trip Jesus up. Now, in this case, the lawyer rejected Jesus or intended to test him. So it could either, it could either be that he was trying to catch Jesus in saying something that could later be used against him by the Jewish authorities. Or maybe he was hoping that he would misspeak and say something that wasn't consistent with something that Jesus had taught earlier. We don't know whether the lawyer was acting in malice or if he was sincerely asking Jesus this question. What shall I do, the lawyer asked. Now for him, for the lawyer, acceptance into the kingdom meant that he had to do something in order to receive it. So he didn't understand the concept of divine grace. He wanted to know what steps he had to take in order to earn salvation. <coughs> now instead of answering the lawyer's question in good rabbinic style, Jesus asked the lawyer a question back. This teaching method challenged the learner to search out an answer rather than just being given one. And it also allowed the teacher to kind of get an idea of where the student was coming from. What did he already know so that Jesus could base a further answer upon what the, the student came back with. So he asked the lawyer, what is written in the law? Which would direct the lawyer right back to his own area of expertise. I mean, as a Jewish lawyer, he was an expert, quote unquote, in the Jewish law. Jesus wanted the lawyer to understand that the law was more than just a collection of legal regulations, but it was the center of divine, divine revelation. In God's law, God shows us what he is and what he expects us to be as well. So Jesus' question, how readest thou, was an invitation to the lawyer to give his interpretation. Now at this point, the lawyer quoted two Old Testament passages. The first, Deuteronomy 6.5, was what was called the Shema because it begins, Hear, O Israel, and a devout Jew would repeat it twice every day, that we are to love our Lord with our whole entire being. The second Old Testament passage in the lawyer's response is Leviticus 19.18, which is also found in Romans 13.9, Galatians 5.14, and James 2.8, where we're told that we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And in Luke, these two passages are combined into a single command. We don't know whether they had ever been linked together before Jesus' time, but Jesus made a point to make sure that his hearers understood that you can't love God without loving your neighbor. If you don't love God, then you're never going to, if you don't love your neighbor, then you're never going to truly love God because you're not going to be obedient to him. A neighbor is to be loved as thyself, which means in the same ways, to the same degree, with the same commitment as a person exercised in caring for and providing for themselves. Now this Greek word, love, that's used here is agapeo which is the verb form of the noun agape. And agape is the unselfish, total love 
which in the larger message of the New Testament, we come to understand is God's love. God loves us totally and unconditionally. That's agape love. Now, I've always, in my mind, kind of understood agape love to mean that no matter how much I obey God and how much I am compassionate to people and things that I do, there's nothing I can do to make God love me any more than He already does. But at the same time, no matter how sinful I may be or how many things I do wrong, God's not going to love me any less than He loves me right now. That's agape love. That's total love. And in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, we're given a more detailed description of what agape love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It is not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Now at this point, the lawyer may have felt a little bit uncomfortable with how this dialogue with Jesus was going. If his intent was to trap Jesus, he'd fail. And perhaps he felt trapped himself because Jesus had turned the question back upon the lawyer. If he earnestly wanted to know how to inherit eternal life, he may have felt embarrassed because Jesus pointed out to him he already knew the answer. He just hadn't put it into practice. He wasn't living it. If his intent was to establish that Jesus' teaching was consistent with the law, well, obviously, he had. Whichever was the case, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, asked a follow-up question. Now, this word willing can be translated as wishing or wanting or desiring, and justify means to show one to be right. So the lawyer wanted Jesus to show him that he was right in his understanding. He either wanted to prove that he'd been faithful to the law as he understood it and as Jesus agreed, or he wanted to find an excuse for why he'd not been able to be obedient to the law. Depending on how the word neighbor was defined would determine whether the lawyer had truly honored God's word. So he asked, who is my neighbor? Now the lawyer, like most Jews of his time, probably had a very narrow definition of what the word neighbor meant. To a Jew, a neighbor was a fellow Jew. End of sentence. Wasn't a Samaritan, wasn't a Gentile, wasn't anyone else other than a, a Jew. Clearly, Jesus didn't share that narrow view, and neither should we. The lawyer was looking for the minimum obedience required. But Jesus <coughs> requires total obedience. By asking the question he did, the Jewish lawyer demonstrated his lack of understanding of God's instruction about loving your neighbor. Now, there used to be a saying, maybe it still is, you go into an expensive jewelry store or a luxury car dealership, and they say, if you have to ask how much something costs, you can't afford it. Well, by asking who his neighbor was, the Jewish lawyer obviously didn't get it. Jewish answer, Jesus answered the lawyer's question by telling a parable. A story easily understood by his listeners with a clear, unmistakable lesson. The setting and the characters would have been familiar to the lawyer as well as to Jesus' other listeners that day. So with the exception of a surprise ending, the story was very realistic. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And in the Bible, it always tells us that when someone leaves Jerusalem, they go down somewhere else. And that's because Jerusalem is 2,500 feet above sea level. Now, in this case, Jericho is actually 800 feet below sea level. So going from Jerusalem to Jericho, which was a distance of about 17 miles, is really going down. I mean, you're, you're going down more than half a mile in elevation. And it's one of the lowest cities in the world. Now, James 4.17 tells us that it's a sin for a person who knows to do what is good and doesn't do it. So failure to act is a failure to love. And failure to love is a sin. So we have first a priest and then a Levite who see this man laying at the side of the road, naked, maybe dead or close to death, stripped of everything that he had, 
and they both cross over the road to the other side and pass by. They don't stop to help. Now, the lawyer who initiated, initiated this dialogue held priests and Levites in high regard, probably. They were the religious leaders of the day. But we know that they were corrupt and they cared more about their power and wealth than about the spiritual well-being of the people and the nation. Efforts have been made through centuries to try to explain away the priest and the Levites' lack of response. They may have been concerned about ritual defilement. You touch a dead body and you're ritually defiled for a certain period of time. They might have been afraid that the man wasn't really as bad off as he looked like, but he might have been bait, and that other thieves were hiding behind the rocks nearby, and that when someone came to help this man, they would jump on them and rob them. Now, Jesus didn't explain their behavior, but he, 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 did, he didn't make them villains in the sense of them being overly wicked. He just stated facts of his story. While those who heard the story might have expected more from their religious leaders, they also might have identified with their hesitancy to act. They may have even thought to themselves, well, I would have done the same thing. I would have passed by and gotten out of there because obviously sometime in the recent past, this man had been attacked and beaten up. The tragedy in this parable is that the priest and the Levite represent the vast majority of people. They think they can be religious and please God whether they show love or not. Indifference to the needs of others is fine as long as I attend church and tithe, they think. Ignoring those who suffer won't matter in the long run, as long as I don't worship idols or lie or cheat or steal or commit adultery or kill. But love is proactive. It's not an emotion. It's a decision. It's an action, an act of the will. One more traveler journeyed down this road. The mere mention of him could easily have elicited hisses and boos from the audience that, for Jesus that day. The general perception probably would have been, oh, it's all over now for the injured man. He's as good as dead. If he isn't already, if anything remains to be taken, the poor man will be stripped of that too. No one would ever expect a Samaritan to be a hero. Now the story ended after Jesus detailed what the Samaritan did for this man, not just to minister to him there by the road, but to take him to an inn and give money to the innkeeper and stay overnight and ensure with the innkeeper that any further expense that might come about while the innkeeper took care of this man, the Samaritan would come back on his next journey and repay him. When the lesson ended, though, Jesus didn't state the lesson, but he asked the lawyer another question, which would force him to acknowledge the point of the story. Which now of these three was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Now, by this question, the lawyer was forced to focus on the Samaritan. His original question had been, who is my neighbor? But the lawyer's question had the potential to pose a limit. He was looking for limits on who he had to consider was his neighbor. But Jesus' question opened the door to an inclusiveness in which a person asked, how can I be a neighbor? Perhaps the lawyer couldn't force himself to answer forthrightly. He didn't say the Samaritan. He couldn't even say that word. But he said, he that showed mercy on him. That being true, Jesus said unto the lawyer, go and do thou likewise. He was to be a neighbor to everyone and anyone, even Samaritans, just as the Samaritan in the story had been a neighbor to a Jew in need. This is what those who have eternal life are expected to do. Many years ago, an astonishing thing happened in New York City. This was in 2007. A construction worker named Wesley Autry was standing on a subway platform with his two young daughters, aged four and six, waiting on a train. Suddenly, another man on the platform appeared to have a seizure and stumbled off the platform onto the tracks. Just at that moment, the headlights of a train came out of the tunnel and entered the station. Now, acting quickly and with no thought for his personal safety, Wesley Autry jumped down onto the tracks to rescue the stricken man by dragging him out of the way of the oncoming train. But he immediately realized that he didn't have time to do that. He couldn't get him off the tracks safely. So he pressed his body down on top of the other man's body in between the tracks 
as the train passed over their heads, passed over top of them. Wesley was so close to the train as it passed over him that it left grease marks on his knitted cap. When the train came to a halt, Wesley called up to the frightened onlookers on the platform, there are two little girls up there. Let them know their daddy is okay. Immediately, and for good reason, Wesley Autry became a national hero. People were deeply moved by his selflessness, and they marveled at his bravery. What Wesley had done was a remarkable deed of concern or compassion for another person. He obviously had no reason to help this stranger. He didn't know the man. He had two young daughters to think about. What he did was at severe risk to his own life. But a human being was in desperate need, and Wesley saw it, and moved with compassion, did what he could to save him. Newspapers called him the Subway Superman, or the Harlem Hero. One headline even described him as being, quote, Good Samaritan saves man on subway tracks, unquote. Now what are the chances that we're ever going to be afforded an opportunity to throw ourselves on subway tracks to save someone's life? It's not very likely. Mm -hmm. But that's not the point. What the point is, is what kind of neighbor are we when we become aware of someone who's in need? <coughs> are we willing to go out of our way to help? And does it depend on who the person is? Are they like us? Or are they different? There is so much hate in the world today. We don't have to look overseas to see radical Islamists putting Christians <coughs> to death. We see hate in our own country. Amen. And we can't avoid it unless we live in a cave and have no contact with the outside world. But is that our attitude as well? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 44, as part of his Sermon on the Mount, he said, we are to love your, he said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use and persecute you. But what if someone isn't our enemy, but is just someone who's different from another country, a different race, religion, social class, or political party? Same rules apply. When we let ourselves be absorbed into the culture around us and adopt the same attitudes towards those who are different, then we're no longer letting our light shine before men, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden underfoot. Have we lost our saltiness? Does our light no longer shine? Recently, Joanne and I attended our grandson's school a couple weeks ago, their observance of Grandparents' Day. And when we got to his classroom, we were given several sheets of paper questionnaires uh, to fill out. One had to do with things that we liked or things that we did when we were in fifth grade. But also, some of the questions had to do with what has changed in the world since we were in fifth grade. And one of the questions was, what one thing do you wish had not changed over the years? And to that question, I answered civility. We live in a very uncivil society. People treat other people like they don't care about them. They don't matter. And, and that's just not right. Now, it's, it's interesting that some years ago, a professor at Princeton did a study where he, he looked at why some people are generous and compassionate and why are others not. He found that for many compassionate people, something had happened to them earlier in their life. Someone had acted with compassion toward them. And this experience had transformed their lives, literally. It had made them into a different person. He told the story of Jack Casey, who's a paramedic now, as an adult, who works on a rescue squad. But, and he grew up in, a, in an abusive home. His father was an alcoholic. All his father ever taught him was that he didn't want to grow up to be like his dad. That's the one thing he learned from his father. But something happened to him when he was a child that changed his life, changed his heart. He was having surgery one day as a child, and he was very frightened as any child would be expected to be. And he remembered the surgical nurse standing there holding his hand as he went to sleep, compassionately calming him, saying, don't worry, I'll be here beside you. 
and no matter what happens. And when he woke up again, there she was, just as she had said. Now years later, when he was a paramedic, he was sent to the scene of a horrible highway accident. A man was pinned upside down in his pickup truck, and Jack was trying to get him out of the wreckage. Gasoline was dripping around him. They were using the jaws of light to try to break into the truck. A spark could have set that gasoline on fire. The driver was frank, crying out how scared he was, and Jack remembered what had happened to him as he prepared to go into that surgery so many years before. He said, look, don't worry, I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. And then when he said that, he later remembered what that nurse had said to him. Days later, that truck driver came to the rescue squad and said, Jack, you know you were an idiot. The thing could have exploded and we both would have been burned up. And Jack replied, I just couldn't leave you. Because Jack had had an experience where someone had been compassionate towards him. Well, guess what, folks? We've all had an experience where someone has been compassionate for us. The man who jumped on the subway track, Jack, they realized that they were in a dangerous situation, but they still took a risk to help someone else. But they, they knew that there was a good chance that they would survive. Well, there's someone who gave his life for us, who knew when he went to that cross he was going to die, and yet he was willing to be so <coughs> compassionate towards us Amen. We were that beaten man at the side of the road, and Jesus was our good Samaritan. He saved us. He tends to our wounds. Sin beats us up. Sin leaves us naked with no defense. And yet Jesus Christ gave his life for us Amen. so that we could have eternal life. Mm -hmm. So every one of us has had a compassionate act performed on our behalf, and we can do no less than to be compassionate towards others as well. We as a society have become so uncivil to each other that it's hard to recognize us as a Christian nation anymore. We, as Christians, bear the responsibility to reverse this sad trend. We must be shining examples of love for our neighbors. If we have to ask, who is my neighbor? We just don't get it. We just don't get it. If you have never truly acknowledged that Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for you, that he was your good Samaritan, maybe now is the time that you need to acknowledge that and let him know how much you appreciate, not just in words and in feelings, but in action. Because love is an action. So as we go into prayer, I'm going to ask that the deacons will come up here, and if anyone wishes to come forward to speak with someone, They'll be glad to be talk with you. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for the unconditional love that you have for us. So much, Lord, that you sent your Son to perform the ultimate act of compassion on our behalf, to die for us, to rescue us, as we lay dead upon that road, dead in our sins, with no defense, no help, Lord. Nothing that we can do. No act that we can perform to obtain eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Help me, Lord, to be the compassionate Christ that you are, the compassionate Samaritan that was in your parable that doesn't look upon someone because of their differences, but looks upon someone because of their needs. As our group now sings, find it in your heart to honor Jesus by being compassionate and loving to all of our neighbors everywhere. In Jesus' name we pray.